Thank you. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's meeting of the Infrastructure, Safety and Growth Scrutiny Committee on the 22nd of November. Um, welcome to everyone, and can I remind everyone that the meeting is being recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube. Um, I'd like to start by welcoming Councillor Lewis Smith as a member of our committee, taking over from Councillor Lee Wood, and also... Um, just to say that we no longer have Councillor Clements on our committee as she became a member of the Cabinet yesterday. So we will miss her input on this committee, that's for sure. I have received apologies from Councillor Jason Jones and Councillor Rosie Claymore. Does anybody have any others? I don't think there's anybody left, so that's fine. Um, at this point, I would like to apologise for the lateness of the minutes going out to the committee. It's totally my fault. I had um, IT problems, which was probably user error as much as anything, and then everything seemed to roll into one, and we just... I thought I'd sent them to Leanne, and I hadn't, so... But I understand that they've all gone out now. All been published. So, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, fine. Been published. Right. Um, item two, then, declarations of interest. Has anybody got anything they wish to declare? Apart from the noise of the coffee maker. <laughs> yeah. Is it... Doing it all on its own. <laughs> <laughs> Item three, then, um, is update from myself. Um, at this point, I just think I'd like to update people on the working group for the housing repairs that we attended last week. It, it was a start to the process. I think that's what we need to say. We, we got a lot of information from the officer, and there was questions that we asked to be sent back. So... As I say, I think that's the starting point, and it's it's quite a, an extensive working group. So I think they'll we should get something out of it. There's lots and lots of councillors on it. I'm hoping that um, we will come to good conclusions at the end of it. So item four: responses to reports of the ISAG scrutiny committee. Um, so further to the meeting that this committee had on the 17th of October, I actually attended Cabinet on the 9th of November to pre present our scrutiny recommendations. And this was with regard to the off-street parking, the, the item that we had on that. And Cabinet were happy to approve our recommendation. So that has gone through. And thank you to everyone who was instrumental in putting that forward. Item 5, consideration of matters referred to ISAG from the Cabinet or Council. There are none of those. So straight on to item six, our nature recovery declaration. And I think I'm introducing Councillor Jay on this. And um, Anna Miller, please. Which one of you is going to start? I'll just say um, thanks for the intro. I'm in a new position currently, temporarily. And um, this is, uh, I don't know all the details, so I'll happily hand over to Anna Miller. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So nature recovery declaration is, is this particular agenda item. The purpose of this is to declare that nature is in crisis and to commit to the recovery of nature across the borough and wider Staffordshire. So the recommendations for this report is that the Borough Council makes a nature recovery declaration as set out in Appendix 1, which if you scroll to the bottom of the report, it follows on from that. Um, it's very similar to the climate change emergency declaration that we made in 2019. It's obligating the council to take further action um, for a particular issue, nature recovery in this, in this respect. And it's obligating us to, to take action to recover nature across the borough in all the operations, uh, policies and activities that we get involved in. So in terms of just a little bit of background to this, as a point of fact, we are experiencing that uh, nature is in crisis. Um, data confirms that 41% of wild species are in decline nationally and 15% are facing extinction. Now, the government is aware of this and through the Environment Act 2021, they have made some legally binding commitments um, for themselves, but for organisations such as local authorities to take action to try and halt in the first instance, but reverse decline and then improve in that sort of sequence. So nature recovery um, is expected to address the four key principles of the Lawson Report 2010, that there must be more space given to wildlife, 
existing wildlife spaces must be expanded. The quality of existing wildlife spaces should be improved by better habitat management and the connectivity between wildlife spaces must be enhanced. And there are various bodies that are looking at this, the Wildlife Trust, who have also been involved in writing this report and getting the declaration kind of consistent with those across Staffordshire. But also the Staffordshire Sustainability Board have also taken a keen interest and have asked that all Staffordshire authorities make this commitment to a nature declaration. And most in Staffordshire have already done so, so we're just sort of joining joining that sort of group. So I just want to briefly talk through sort of two aspects, which are probably the ones that you'll hear the most about. Um, the first one is the no a local nature recovery strategy. Um, this is something that the government are funding key authorities to deliver. And for Staffordshire, it's the county council. They've just set up their nature recovery strategy. It's a working group which officers are invited to. Uh, I'm attending the next meeting, for example. Um, they have until the end of March 25 to get a local nature recovery strategy in place. Um, that's quite hard to say quickly, which, is, which essentially is uh, like a habitat map, which would be uh, Staffordshire-wide, so pan-Staffordshire, and sort of biodiversity priorities across Staffordshire as well. So we're all, we're all taking part in that Staffordshire-wide one. Um, clearly, we'll probably need to do something for ourselves. A bit more Tamworth local than Tamworth specific. And I've attached as appendix to some work that we've already done a couple of years ago, obviously ahead of the curve, because it, it, it fits quite nicely. We've done some habitat mapping already. Um, and we're looking to enhance that, looking at priorities across the borough with some DEFRA money that we've got allocated to us to help look at biodiversity net gain. So that's nature recovery strategies. Um, and then moving on to biodiversity net gain, this is probably something you've heard about, particularly if you sit on planning committee. Um, it's something that we already do through our own local plan policies, but it's now enshrined in legislation um, through the Envir Environment Act that we have to ensure that for certain types of applications and where it's um, appropriate that, there, that there's better wildlife at the end of the development than before the development started, which is, is a legal requirement now to do. Um, it was due to be implemented November, so now, but the government have pushed the large site implementation back to January, small sites, April, and so on. So we're, we're ready as a planning team already to, to validate, get the... Um, applicants and agents to submit the right information so that we can make assessments through ecological consultants to be able to implement that biodiversity net gain or BNG for, for short um, as soon as it's required which is in the new year. What I've also just put in the report is just a, a couple of other sort of areas where um, habitats and, and wildlife um, are sort of prioritised. You've got road verges, tree planting, of course, and the positive contribution that that makes, protecting peatlands, having nature-based solutions to climate change and access to nature. So if you look at Appendix 1, the declaration basically sets out um, <coughs> that we recognise as a borough council that there is a, a, a nature crisis. It also sets out how we will help to put nature back into recovery. And there's a few things there, like a na local nature recovery action plan for Tamworth, like I've just said, to, which will you know, be supported by that wider Staffordshire local nature recovery strategy. About embedding nature recovery into all strategic plans and policies, and um, you know, using our nature recovery map, which is Appendix 2, to help inform decision making. And to ensure that it's well understood across the authority. Uh, and complements other relevant plans and strategies. And obviously BNG, which as I said, is legislatively already uh, almost implemented in, in planning anyway. And then it just sets out uh, against certain key requirements like 30 by 30, it's about managing at least 30% of our council owned green spaces for the benefit of wildlife. What we're gonna do about protected um, designated landscapes, road verges, tree planting, etc., etc., following on from the report. Um, and then at the end of the report, it's just a short few paragraphs on the responsibility and governance around this. So it would be for the leader of the council to be responsible for the declaration and its delivery. 
It's for the Assistant Director of Operations and Leisure to be the lead op officer for this work. It's for this committee to monitor the Local Nature Recovery Action Plan when it's prepared and ready. But it's also to work closely with the county and other local partners, um, like the Local Nature Recovery Partnership, to kind of move ourselves forward as an organisation. So thank you, Chair, and I'm willing to take questions. Thank you for that, Anna. Um, really pleased to see this coming forward because it, it would be easy for us as, as a borough council to say this isn't our problem. You know, we're so densely um, built up, we could easily say we haven't got any space to do any of these things, but there is still always things that we can do. So I'm really pleased to see that we're doing it. And for me, our children and grandchildren wouldn't thank us to ignore this. This is something that we have to do, we can't ignore. So really pleased to see this. Um, is there any questions? Thank you. A question to Councillor Jay. Um, a key part of this work, obviously, is working with our partners. Um, we, we've, we're members of many partnerships around this issue, and the Staffordshire Sustainability Board is one of those. Um, we're not being represented that people aren't attending from this authority. Can you commit to ensure that people are attending this important partnership from this authority? Yeah, absolutely. I agree with what you, uh, what you said there. It's a fact, and uh, it's something that needs resolving, so absolutely, yeah. Are you able to confirm why we've not been not been represented? Why our elected members have not been attending those meetings so far this this sort of municipal year? Uh, it, well, it's not been under my remit, but no, uh, off the top of my head, no. It's a part, you know, it's an important partnership. We need to make sure that we are attending these meetings. Is is that something, Councillor Jay, that we can ask that to make sure that we do have somebody who's some name in the frame and that they will be keen to go? Yeah. So, I mean, my, my answer back is absolutely. I fully commit to that. Um, and then whoever the, the you know the, the leader is and has a remit in the next few weeks, whenever that is, then you know I would hope that they stick they to that as well, and they have my my view on that as well. Thank you. But why doesn't that happen to this point? Um, like I can say, I, I can't really answer. Thanks. Ben. Well, thank you, Chair. Um, I absolutely welcome this plan, especially, um, I know my constituents, um, so the people will, look at, will, you know, will welcome this, having the Kettlebrook Nature Reserve and the Town Wall Nature Reserve. Um, I just had a, a little clarification. You may have touched on this, um, just about progress reports, particularly from like the leader, that, that's something that's in, in this report, yeah? Yeah, so in Appendix 1, which sets out the declaration, which will ultimately go to full council for endorsement, um, at, at the very bottom of the declaration, it just sets out sort of responsibilities and governance around it. And it's to ensure that we're not just saying it and, and not doing it. So, for example, the scrutiny committee has suggested this one would want to keep progress on track by having regular updates, like we do with other sort of significant programs and projects in the authority it's the same principle yeah okay thank you um these things worry me uh, and what worries me about them is it's not about the intent the intent is absolutely spot on and it, it's what we should be striving for and it picks up on the point that was made earlier about we're an urban area you know uh, we shouldn't use that as an excuse etc but what worries me about this is how embedded are these strategies in our day-to-day -day work as a local authority and the reason i say this is i've uh, had the fortune of living in the same area of tamworth for most of my life uh, and way back a number of years ago when i moved to that area the linear lakes uh belgrave lakes as most people quirkily call them uh, were Nice cut grass, you know, kids playing football. You know, they were a leisure venue for recreation time. We've now, for a number of reasons, moved on to the stage where we've turned them into a local nature reserve and we've, we've changed our, uh, our approach to them. However, what I've seen is a convenient excuse not to cut brambles, not to litter pick, not to drive any machinery into the area and keep them tidy. So actually, whilst it's, you know, now it's looking okay because all the dead leaves are covering the rubbish. In the winter, it looks beautiful because the snow's on top of the dead leaves, on top of the rubbish. In the spring, 
it's an absolute nightmare. And what concerns me is we, we use this designation of, oh, it's, it's a nature reserve, blah, 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 therefore we shouldn't touch it and let nature take its course. Actually, there are still human beings throwing rubbish out of their windows of cars and it's still blowing into these hedgerows. So the quality is probably worse than it was when we manicured the lawns and you know made them artificially pretty. So what I'm worried about is that are we aligned in terms of our operation to make sure we are actually maintaining these and are we making sure that we're not using this as a convenient excuse to cut back once every 10 years instead of once every three months? Um, so they're the two big concerns. Uh, and I think attached to that is, in terms of convenience, how convenient is it to say, well, there's a bit of a stream that runs through there. We'll call that a, a wetland. Uh, and therefore, that changes our responsibility, but also ticks our box on what we, uh, on the on the the square footage or whatever we've got. So that is what concerns me, is how we shoehorn things into strategies, or potentially could, but also how we embed them in our day-to-day -day operation. Thank you for that. Um, that does raise some points, doesn't it, about if we just let something then be used and whatever the land is like, whether it is manicured or left to grow over, is no excuse for it to be full of litter. That that doesn't that isn't part of this at all. Is there any um, anything in this where well you're saying it's coming to us for it to be monitored, but it's about all of these um, areas. What is the resource that we put on them? Thanks. So I think in response, um, in terms of day to day operation, we probably already do some of this. Um, it's just not labelled nature recovery. It will be labelled um, open spaces maintenance or wildlife creation or, or something different, but not necessarily nature recovery. So I think there will be some embedding already, but there will need to be, I think, a bit of a change in mindsets in terms of actually making this the thing and, and how do we deliver this and how does it all feed together. There's going to have to be a change in how we, we think about it and how the operations might need to change to align to it. Um, so that all said, I think it's quite interesting that the lead assistant director isn't me. It's, it's the person who's coming in and the post is currently vacant um, and they're due to start, I believe, in December. Um, who, uh, because the, the, the biggest issue is seen to be that open spaces, that maintenance, road verges, um, that uh, assistant director also looks after the arboricultural service, tree planting, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So whilst I might have climate change and adaptation within my sort of remit, and biodiversity net gain absolutely fits within the planning system and within planning committee responsibilities, that the majority of this is actually felt to sit elsewhere. Now I'm bringing it to committee because we have an obligation through the Staffordshire Sustainability Board to try and bring a nature declaration forwards. And in the absence of someone being in this vacant post, I am currently sitting here doing this. That if that person was here, I probably wouldn't be um, because I think the majority of work does actually sit um, within that service. Now, how they will ultimately manage their operation and have these conversations, I think, is up, is up to them. But I do, I do understand the point that you raise is it's not about us being lazy and not doing things and labelling it as something. We've got to be really clear what we're trying to achieve and why. And I guess this is where the role of scrutiny comes in, is to keep these kind of issues in check. And actually, if you're getting a lot of complaints about something, you know, feed it through this committee. And, and that's the forum to have that genuine debate and conversation about, well, how can we do things differently? Or should we even be doing things differently? OK, thank you. I think probably there is a role for us as members to keep our eye on this then, because the, 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 the tenant of it all is fabulous. You know, no, nobody can disagree with it, as I said, but we need to make sure as Jeremy says, that it doesn't fall into um, bad ways. So, yeah, I think it, it's incumbent on, on members to, to keep an eye on it and bring any concerns we have to you. So thank you for that. Is there any more questions? Lewis? Just a quick clarification for Anne. Um, did you say the deadlines for the projects not falling under small sites definition was originally November and now it's been pushed back to January and April? 
Okay, so why wait if we're ready to go? I would have thought we were close to it if the original deadline was November. So we we already deliver biodiversity net gain to a certain extent because um, our local plan policy makes reference to it. Um, it's just that the legislation is quite specific on which applications fall into the categories that would re require a biodiversity net gain plan and some compensation for it. So we are pretty much ready. Um, I don't. I'm going to ask Michael. This is Nikki, by the way, from the planning policy team. It's her first. It's her first uh, outing to committee. Um, can we implement it pre? The legislation coming in. We can, but I don't think we have any applications at the moment that yeah. require it. And the picture with the small sites is still a little bit unclear because where would they get their uh, off site BG yeah. from? It's not there yet. Yeah, so the answer is yes. Yes, potentially, but we've no applications that would fall into the category where it would require a, a biodiversity net gain compensation. We actually would have very few across the year. We've monitored the last three years and not very many applications would actually fall into the category that would require a BNG contribution. I think, unfortunately, whilst we might be ready as a planning authority to receive applications, um, those sites that require offsetting or on-site BNG implementation or off-site or a financial contribution, the, I think the industry is still gearing themselves up to where does that compensation go. So we have a large site and they can't deliver X amount of wildlife or habitat, where in Tamworth does that go? And the, that's, that's probably what we're grappling with most. We haven't got the responsibility necessarily for delivering that. Um, but it's making sure that others are ready for it. That said, we are looking and doing a little bit of work, well, quite a bit of work, actually, around whether we, as a landowner in Tamworth, could actually accommodate some of the BNG offsetting. So there's a bigger conversation here, I think, at some point in the future. If that helps. Thank you. So we're being asked to consider the recommendations and is the committee happy to endorse the recommendations for Cabinet and Council? Is anybody happy to move that? Thank you, Ben. A seconder, Lewis. Um, can I take a vote? Everyone in favour? Thank you. Thank you for, your, for coming along and presenting that, Anna. And um, if those relevant to this item would like to leave, we're happy for you to... Um, Leave if you need to. Thank you. So we're going on to item seven, the environmental crime policy update. So we're going to have um, a verbal community safety update to consider the proposals for amendments to environmental crime fixed penalty levels outlined in the government ASB action plan. <laughs> Quite a mouthful. So welcome to um, Joe Sands and portfolio holder Martin Summers. And also we have, we're very lucky to have with us Chief Inspector Rob Neeson. So I'll hand over to you guys. Why not? I'm here. <laughs> Thanks. I'll let you speak in a bit. It's fine. <laughs> um, so uh, in May, the government introduced its new antisocial behaviour um, action plan. And the report in front of you tonight is the... Uh, environmental ASB side of things and uh, it's to con consider changes to our policy that are enabled or potentially enabled because of the changes to that action plan um, so the, I mean the main headlines really are the fees um, for uh, cri environmental crimes like fly tipping um, and uh, littering uh, and f fly posting and so on and as you'll see, the, the amounts that we charge currently, or that can be charged for those particular crimes in the tables. Um, now, it's come to scrutiny because uh, obviously it, this this is something directly impacting on the on the general public. So um, it would be interesting to have scrutiny's feedback on um, the proposed charges. Now, we've only um, really decided, or rather, I have said that we should be charging the maximum £1,000 fine for fly tippers um, and we haven't changed anything else but I'll be interested to hear your feedback on uh, on that. 
Um, the the thousand pound for fly tippers, which is a heinous crime amongst um, uh, littering, but I, I would consider it the worst. Uh, we really need a, a, a larger deterrent than the four hundred pounds that we currently do charge people um, if they're caught doing it. And you notice that we've only in, issued one fixed penalty notice for that recently, um, but you know, hopefully it will be more of a deterrent going forwards if it, we're at the maximum fines. Uh, like I say, interested in your opinions on the others. Uh, but um, in terms of uh, fly tipping, uh, you'll notice in the report that we have actually, and you may have seen press around it, uh, we've now got environmental uh, cameras uh, out. So as a result of the work that Councillor Pritchard did whilst he was on Cabinet, he got that ball rolling. And we've got a £26,000 grant to buy um, cameras to catch people in the act at hot spots across the borough. Uh, and they've gone live in Macefield Drive currently, and we've had suggestions on where we are going to put them next. Um, so um, it, it, it's a scourge, uh, littering and fly tipping. Um, you know, some might say it's a, a result of cost of living and so on, but there's absolutely zero excuse to uh, to fly tip anything. You have to be very careful what you do with your own waste. It is yours. Um, you know, it, it's not something you just pass off to somebody and expect them to take responsibility for your waste. Um, this is very much down to the individual uh, deciding what they do with the things they discard from their properties. Um, and if they decide to do it in a legal manner, we will take every means we can um, to, to make them pay for that. So um, you'll note on the fly tipping side of things that we can still take the option, if it is particularly bad, to take people to court and, uh, and have them prosecuted and imprisoned, um, which is more than fitting for that kind of crime, um, or charge them £50,000 for the privilege. Um, as well as a possibility but um that that's basically the headliners of it so uh, i'm sure joe will want to um say a bit more on the subject um but so uh, yeah definitely be interested on scrutiny's feedback on the, the you know the uh, the penalty notices charges thank you thank you um yeah um you know this this the, the this, the reason for the report really was so that we can actually put that through to for consideration by scrutiny for a sort of sign off by cabinet also to update you on the asb action plan moving forward um we've as as, as um, councillor summers has said we've we've increased the fly tipping fine to a thousand pounds in line with the fact we've also got the fly tipping project underway um with regard to that sort of wider community safety, and obviously we'll move on to that yet as a verbal report, I've not done a, a written report on this. So I think there's some debate and consideration to be had around the community safety priorities and where scrutiny would like us to concentrate on, maybe make some recommendations and, and uh, the Chief Inspector will sort of um, update on their, the police side. But I certainly think, you know, we, we would like to take the opportunity to do the, the fly tipping fine first, and concentrate on that fly tipping project and actually then within the next six months march 24 we're reviewing the asb policy and the environmental crime policy based on some actions within the community safety plan um, we've had some work through some asb consultants to look at our triage process on all all variety of asb the police were involved in that and we'd like to take the opportunity over the next six months to review our approach to the rest of the, the, the environmental crime, which is littering. At the moment, it's £100. We do have the option to raise that um, in, you know, within, in the future. Um, so the reason we've concentrated on the fly tipping at the moment is because we, ha we have got that live project underway. Um, so, yes, I think... You know, once you move into that community safety, but the, the recommendations are there for committee to endorse at this time for going to cabinet next week just to sort of sign that through. So, you know, welcome any questions. I'm going to say, can, if, if it's okay with the committee, I'd like to keep this one separate and then move on to that wider community safety for that discussion. Then, right, and okay. the Chief Inspector can bring in the police side of things. Thank you. Um, I've just got a couple of points. Um, more, I suppose, more with the, the grid than anything. T to my mind, there are different kinds of fly tipping. There's domestic and then there's commercial. So the commercial should always be <clears throat> heavily um, sanctioned. And I would expect, you know, somebody who is doing this as a living to be paying the ultimate fine, definitely. Um, 
the the bit where it's bracketed together littering graffiti and fly posting is there any reason why it's bracketed together because the littering to me is another heinous crime because it's something that people learn to do so it, it does need to be stopped the the graffiti and the fly posting seem a different kind of crime um going on to the bit about the cameras and the money that we've got for the cameras how many is this you say that they're in place in Maysfield Drive. Has this been advertised to people or is this a covert operation? I'll just take the, the, the fines. Yeah. The reason I put littering, graffiti and fly posting in there is because they are the same fine level through the environmental crime, through the env environmental Act 1990, it's gone out of my head, but they are just that that is the, they are treated within the environmental crime policy as separate things but with the same so fine value. Treat them. No, no, they, they are uh, the cameras. Yes, we have six deployable. Um, Maysfield Drive um, was chosen as one of our AS littering hot, I'm sorry, fly tipping hot spots. Um, yes, the press release has gone out. Yes, the cameras are overt. Um, and yes, there are signs in place. Um, so, and everywhere we put the cameras, they will be overt and they will have signs on them. Um, as Councillor Pritchard would know, we've had extensive conversations about overt and covert cameras. Um, yeah, but we, 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 you know, the decision to make them overt really is so that we do not get, fall into any kind of um, considerations around collateral sort of fallout from the cameras within 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 a position. It also gives us an opportunity to say that they're there. So, and with the um, cameras in place, we are actually just um, circulating leaflets and information in those areas. The second one has gone up, I, I believe, on Tinker's Green, um, and um, another one. There are, there, I think, there was a hot spot. One of can't remember which councillor has reported it. We're looking into putting another camera up there. So is it one at each site? It's one at each site, the six of them. And the, 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 the advantage of the cameras is we don't just have to use them for fly tipping. We can use them for other ASB if we need to. They are battery powered. They don't need to be linked to um, any lamppost power. They come straight back to um, a laptop um, and we can you know, use our powers within the acts to, to look at registration numbers. Etc. Uh, Etc. Et and we can also advertise if we catch if where we see people. There are issues around some bring sites, they're littering, but they are movable. The litter cam, uh, we're still waiting the trial on that. Uh, that will be on the A the old A5 Watling Street. Um, we still have issues around putting cameras on highways posts, um, and we are falling into a little bit of trouble with Staffordshire at the moment, trying to get the information through to put the, that that camera onto a highways lamppost but a litter cam will actually it can actually show if something gets thrown out of a car it can actually tell what that item is um, it, so we want to try it for two weeks to, to actually prove that concept and that way we can actually issue fixed penalties civil fixed penalties to people who are the car registered keeper um, which is, a, which is a bit more automated, it's a bit of an easy way. So it's actually implementing something we put into the environmental crime policy a few years ago. We've never been able to get to the stage where we can actually identify and report registered keepers. Do we know why Staffordshire are worried about it then? They're, they're not helping us. And also, you know, just as, <laughs> as a comment, I can't understand the mentality that chucks something out of a car yeah. window instead of keeping it, you know with you and taking it home but you know that's just me i wouldn't i wouldn't say that they're not helping us it, there are very prescriptive prescriptive forms and things you need to fill out when you put onto a highways infrastructure basically you've got to sort of put the wind load on the lamp post you're tapping into their power um yeah uh, but highways have said it, it's that's more difficult but even on highways you don't want things falling off on a dual no. carriageway but yeah it, it's more around the health and safety and the access to the power that's the issue any questions? Rob? Thank you. Sorry, I got there first. Um, uh, so thank you, Joe, and thank you, Martin. Um, you know, we've had long discussions about this, and I'm really glad to see them there. Um, before I forget, with my separate hat on, if you do have any problems, Joe, just let me know, and I'll, I'm with the Chief Exec in the morning, so at uh, County, so I can 
keep chasing this up to make sure the obstacle goes away. Um, uh, in terms of the the fly tipping and, and the environmental crime, um, I've always been of the mindset there's three types of, um, should we say, fly tipping. There's, there's lazy people domestic fly tipping. They just are just throwing it because they can't be bothered to take it to the tip or... Um, for whatever reason, they just think that's acceptable. There are there's commercial where it is businesses fly tipping again for various reasons, but there's also organised crime, and actually you can only see the sort of the thin end of the wedge, um, and it can be anything related to um, businesses actually, as we say, illegal businesses making money out of fly tipping, um, or for example, drug den being cleared, that sort of stuff, where the, the the stuff gets left behind, so it gets cleaned out and just disposed of on country lanes. I think the authorities should use everything in its power to come down on them with the maximum penalties we have available to us. Um, there is absolutely no excuse for fly tipping. It's not like you can say, um, oh, I didn't realise because it's a deliberate act. You know, it's, I'm, I've never known anybody who's accidentally fly tipped in the borough. Um, and I think it's the same with, with littering. I think if we hit people in the pocket, they will stop doing it. And I think we should use the maximum force we can to prosecute anybody caught for littering, fly tipping, graffitiing, they will eventually learn and they will stop doing it. A um, couple of things, uh, and just listen to Rob made me think, um, and it goes back to what I said on the last report about embedding this across all of our services. Um, I rang up uh, the waistline and said, I've got, a, I've got a suite that needs picking up. And I went, okay, no problem, you know, sorted, yeah. Uh, is it a three-piece or two-piece? It's a three-piece. It's two two-seaters and a one. Oh, no, we can't do that. A three-piece is a three-seater and two ones. So what do I do on my two-seater? Oh, you'll have to book another one and pay again. But hold on a minute. It's three pieces. A couple of years later, I had a corner suite. They won't touch them. It breaks into three pieces. <sighs> yeah, it's corner sweet. The bureaucracy in our own collection is, is just mind-boggling. You sit there, you go, I wonder why that guy dropped that three piece at the end of the road. Not me, obviously. I responsibly got rid of mine. Talking of responsibly getting rid of things, the, um, the what was it, the household duty, what's it called now? Got it in front of me. The duty of care. The duty of care, that's it. Um, so we've got here that, uh, that the household duty of care default penalty of £200 is introduced and £150 if paid within 14 days. So I've got a challenge to that. My challenge is I can ring man in a van and say, I've got about eight yards of waste I need removing. How much will you charge me? 100 quid. Nice one. Come pick it up for me. Because if I pay within 14 days, that's cost me 250 quid. An eight-yard skip will cost me 300 quid. It's cheaper for me to phone man in the van, get it dumped in the lane by his house, and pay the fine than it is for me to hire a skip. So if we're going to fine people, make sure it's worth fining people. I know families who go on holiday during term time because it's cheaper to pay the fine than it is to pay the holiday uh, company. So that concerns me that actually, yes, it's a big step, but it's still not enough because it's still cheaper than doing it properly. And if it's cheaper to get fined than doing it properly, why would you load your own skip up when you've got a man in a van who is willing to do it for you? So we've got to make sure we are robust and hard on that. Um, and in terms of the fly tipping, and I, I take the points that the portfolio holder made earlier uh, about the level, but the fact we've only successfully prosecuted one person out of 1,100 and something actions, uh, <sighs> Surely that's not just, just because they're really good at hiding their bank statements before they drop the bag of litter at the side of the road. You know, surely we're letting something through or we're not trying hard enough. These figures on a bit of paper are wonderful as bits of figures on a bit of paper. But unless you do somebody and report it and make an example of them, it's not a deterrent, is it? It's just a figure on a bit of paper. So that's my rant, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Anything else? Lewis? Yeah, I pretty much had about three things to say, and Jeremy covered two of them there. So about uh, reviewing the legal waste disposal, making sure it's affordable for people, I think that's a great idea. Uh, I do support um, implementing the max penalty fines for uh, fly tipping and all the other crimes. Um, 
the cameras are great. I'm, I'm sure that's great. Um, and that can help uh, towards uh, prosecuting people. And another question I've got is um, if someone's got mobility issues and they can't um, get to a tip to dispose of their own, um, of their waste, which is too big to get into a black bin, is there any support in place to help them legally dispose of this rather than, you know, bringing up a man in a van and getting it dumped somewhere? I think the, the the options there are obviously our <laughs> our uh, waste disposal service where there is a fee which is uh, for for the disposal of the large items. Um, there there is a requirement. The household duty of care requires um, when you employ someone to take your waste, they should be able to provide you with a waste carrier's license and a receipt for the for the items they take. Um, so, you know, the, 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 that probably is around education, making sure that, you know, the householders know that this is what you need to do when you phone up someone to take your waste away. You've got to make sure they're registered waste carriers and can give you a receipt for the, for the items they take because once they get dumped in a country lane, you know, yes, we can, we can, we can provide a fixed penalty to the, the person who's flight it, but it's also that penalty back to the householder. So there are a couple of ways there, and that's around that education, which is what we want to try and get together over the next six months when we're reviewing the ASB policy and the environmental crime policy and the outcomes of this um, project to make sure we've got some more robust procedures and, and processes in place and education campaigns. Thank you. Um, I would say at least 50%, if not more, of people do not know that people who take stuff away need a waste carrier's licence. It's, it's something the general public don't really have, have an eye to. Um, the other thing, before I bring Councillor Summers in, I would ask is <laughs> Jeremy's points about what constitutes something you can take is ludicrous. Absolutely ludicrous. A three-piece suite is a three-piece suite, whether it's got two seats or three seats. Can we have a look at what our criteria is for um, this stuff? Because it needs amending. Because people do have all sorts of configurations of lounge furniture that they need disposing of. Councillor Summers. Thank you. I mean, on that um, particular thing, um, obviously it's within your gift to review any policy under scrutiny, so... Uh, far from me to set your workload, but, you know, bring the policy and have a look at it. Make rec recommendations, as I say, it's within your gift. Um, just in terms of uh, evidence to prosecute, um, sorry, find evidence, uh, hopefully, um, uh, might be kind of overstretching them a bit, but the community impact officers that we have uh, kind of set loose <laughs> um, should hopefully um, help in, in these matters and hopefully be able to help us uh, prosecute a few more people who are littering fly tipping and whatnot they can they can follow through from end to end on cases that uh, that they that they intercept um on the education side of things i've got to hold my hands up and say yeah you are right because when i started this job i was given an education i think by anna um <laughs> about, about utilising your friendly local scrap man to put stuff outside the front of your house. You aren't meant to do that. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's uh, that was an interesting one. I've no, of course, I've never done that, but, you know, um, yeah, you, you shouldn't put your waste out and uh, not take responsibility for it, ultimately. Um, I am very interested in hearing the, the cross-party views that, um, you know, we should put the fines up to the maximum for everything. If that's what the, you know, the, the will of the committee. If you make that recommendation, um, I don't see any problem with that. So, well, it's a, like I say, it's not for me to say. Um, I am your guest, but uh, you know, you feel free. Yeah, can I just say that that's the reason really for bringing it for that consideration as to whether you you know you want me to to sort of look at the impact over the next few months, ready for into March for the review of both policies. But if the recommendation is there that you wish me to actually make sure the environmental crime policy at the moment that says that we charge the maximum, um, you know, by law, um, it, it probably means that then we don't need to amend that policy year on year because actually if anything happens legislation changes again it automatically goes up to the next level um, I'm happy to do that um, I, I, that's the reason I brought it here it's just an amendment through on the recommendation on the cabinet report for next week 
um, you know, cancer summers if you want, you know, you, you, if you're happy for me to do that from those recommendations, I can put that forward to put it all fines at maximum level set by statute, which will automatically raise our litter in fines to £500, our household waste duty of care to £600, um, and, and, and moving forward with that. Thank you. It, do the committee feel that this is something we want to do? If we're taking environmental crime seriously, then why would we not do that? Um, I'll bring Ben in and I'll bring Robin. Uh, thank you, Chair. Oh, uh, thank you, Chair. Just on the, uh, I absolutely agree with the recommendation, but um, would you like to add to it that alongside these changes, we put up, uh, we focus our like our attention on the on the education comms as well to have this going alongside the, the changes to the policy, just so people have got no excuse that if they are caught out by this, we, we did tell them that this was coming. Yeah, I'd say, I'd say that it's very easy to not get clobbered by one of these maximum fines. Just don't fly tip, don't litter. It's, it's really easy. You know, I have zero sympathy for somebody pleading poverty after they've just fly tipped a boot full of stuff on the side of a country lane. Don't do it, and you won't have to pay for it. I think that's the thing, as you say, you can't do it by accident. A piece of paper might fall out of your pocket, that's quite different, but actually chucking something out of a car window or putting your mattress down lane, you know, you have to mean to do it. Did you want to come in, TJ? Yes, just going to say, I obviously don't get a vote tonight, but um, as a member of Cabinet that will see it next week, I fully support going for the, the maximum that Councillor Pritchard has recommended as well. Are we moving that as a recommend, as a, an additional recommendation? Is, is that what we put it down as a, an yeah, additional one? Not, yeah. So is that, do, you, do you want to move that, Councillor Pritchard? A seconder? No, 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 I'm not going to speak. Oh, you want to speak? <laughs> I'm excited. Yeah? Oh, come on then. <laughs> All right, calm down. Not that excited. Um, it was just the point about the, the education bit, and, and I appreciate the sentiment and, uh, and where we're coming from, but... My concern is, and it was as, as the chairman uh, suggested earlier, unless, unless you regularly dispose of furniture, unless you regularly dispose of scrap metal, you aren't, you know, you probably do these things once or twice a year at most. So who are we trying to educate and to what extent when they may only touch that service once every five years or you know what I mean so so in terms of education I think we can put out whatever literature whatever messages we want if Mr Smith sitting at home and suddenly needs to get rid of a, a, a suite the first thing he's going to do he's not going to go on Thomas Borough Council website he's not going to go on Google he's going to go on Facebook and go anybody know someone that can pick up a sofa someone's going to comment DM me, whatever. Right, he's going to get a price for twenty quid. He's going to go great. My safe has gone bang. He's not going to think. Hold on a minute. The borough council sent me a leaflet three years ago. Do, do you know what I mean? So, so whilst I'm saying I'm, I'm not disagreeing that people do need to improve their understanding, what I'm saying is, how much effort do we want to put into that and then hide behind while well, we told you so, when the guy just wants to get rid of your safe and he's took the easiest route because that's the most common option. A bit like. Councillor Summers not putting scrap outside his house when everyone else in the street does. So therefore, as far as you're aware, I mean, Ava does it. I'll just, do you know what I mean? So, so whilst, we, whilst the education is, is important, I'm just concerned as to how much we then sit behind it and go, well, we told you so 10 years ago. Do, do you know what I mean? And, yeah. and we leave people open to... Um, it's just It just concerns me that we're... And it's not just this, it's a number of issues. We go, we need to educate the public. Guy gets up in the morning, goes to work, earns his crust, comes home, sits down, has something to eat, watches a bit of telly. You know, who are we trying to target here and how likely are we to, to get those messages through? Yeah, cheers. No, absolutely. Um, so you put it not proposing like a huge, you know, throw the, the, the kitchen sink at it campaign, perhaps just some you know, semi-regular um, messaging on social media or something like that, not, no, not the kitchen sink. Give that. I think it's something that should definitely be in our um, council tax literature, and we should definitely be advertising if we're going to be putting the prices up. 
because that would be really remiss of us if we didn't. So something would need to be done around that. Did you want to come in? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, um, I, I can absolutely assure that if anything changes like this, there'll be a press release for it um, and it'll be put out on our social media channels as well. But I think, as uh, Rob Neeson will attest, we don't go around advertising that, you know, murder's wrong. <laughs> don't do it. Yeah, it's it, cr crimes are not, uh, you know, there's lots of crimes. Um, we don't advertise them all as being wrong. You shouldn't do them. <laughs> so, um, yeah, on the education point, I understand where you're coming from, but, you know, you're going to miss a lot of people. If you commit the crime, you find out, don't you? <laughs> um, or if you if you are going to dispose of your rubbish, as far as I'm concerned, then you should find out how you should take more personal responsibility for the fact that you are disposing of something that you produced, came out of your property. Um, and... You know, if you don't, then you'll be fined for it. Um, there's no excuse for it, really. Um, yeah, people go about their everyday lives and choose the easiest option. We're all guilty of it. Absolutely we are. But it doesn't make it right. Um, you know, again, if, you, if you're going to do something, there's going to be consequences one way or another. Um, so just, just make sure you are not on the wrong side of the law or on, of our fixed penalty notice. Thank you for that. Um, the only thing I would say in response to that is, unfortunately, some members of the public don't see it as a crime. And that's where the education comes in that, you know, and it needs probably to start at school because you will see children coming out of school and dropping litter. And, you know, it's just one step then, isn't it, when you're older to put in your settee down the lane. So we do need to educate people to some degree, but it's how we do it. And we shouldn't be, you know, spending a fortune on it, but it should be embedded. I think that's what we, we need to see. I was see. just going to say, uh, Chair, I was raised right never to drop litter. So it starts from, you know, I don't think it's necessarily the school, it's the parents. Well, but sometimes... It has to be the school, doesn't it, in the lives of some people. My children always came home with pockets full of rubbish because they knew better than to chuck it down. Rob? I'm a little worried about all the school children fly-tipping sofas at the moment. Um, <laughs> but I'd, I'd say... <laughs> I would say I think you probably find it's quite... From, from you know, I've got young children. They're taught at school about lit littering and, and that sort of thing, and why it's wrong. They're encouraged to litter pick. There's an awful lot of kids in the town that are involved in... Tamworth volunteer litter pickers um, but I find the best way for anybody to learn something is a crime or not acceptable is the punishment they get for it and um, you know if you're hit with a maximum fine for fly tipping you won't do it again um, if you're hit with a maximum fine for litter you won't do it again and I think um, we should forget how much the stick um, as well as the carrot does serve to educate people on right and wrong yeah that brings something to mind actually about what we do after we've actually find people and perhaps that's where the comms needs to come into it we need to be ensuring that we are putting it out there that we have put find somebody a thousand pound yeah just to clarify on a fixed penalty notice um effectively if you have paid your fixed penalty notice um it's negated the crime of the thing so we do when we've issued the last uh, we, we've actually issued another fixed penalty for fly tipping recently outside marmion house um we, we simply state that we've issued um a fixed penalty for fly tipping what we do if we've issued the fixed penalty and they don't pay it is an automatic sort of um, prosecution into the magistrates court um usually through something they call single justice protocol which we, we get the evidence and we the file is put um my you know one of the reasons i was when we were talking about the litter fine earlier about putting it up to the maximum was you are then charging people 500 pound or fining them 500 pound for potentially dropping a crisp packet um or, or something or leaving it um which <coughs> It's fine. That's 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 what the government have, have put in the action plan. We can put it up to the maximum. But of course, you, we are slightly in danger then if they do not pay that fixed penalty. The taking to court then provides a debt to the court, if that makes sense, a, a slightly higher fine, which then actually then incurs further um, budget on ourselves, other, other, other costs of the council. So that was one of the reasons I was owing a little bit on the caution side, on the, the street littering side around the, the maximum. 
but of course we can so, you know there's sorry. no reason not to do it do we if we put it up to a maximum do we always have to find the maximum yes we do yeah there's no sliding scale but that that's the thing with the fly tipping when you were talking about commercial that's obviously comes into to criminal territory you, a lot of the commercial fly tipping is really can quite often cover up other crimes you don't have to actually do a fixed penalty for fly tipping you can go straight to prosecution yeah yeah thank you but i think there's a, there's a step before that isn't there if i was to drop a crisp packet i'd expect to be given the opportunity to pick it up if i was to drop a 10 pound note I'd expect to have found it to pocket it and run away rather than find me for dropping litter on the street. So at what point does a £10 note become litter? And at what point am I no longer allowed to put my packet of crisp up? So the discretion is in that initial stage. Do we have to prosecute for every piece of litter on the floor? Actually, if the person's still there, they've got the opportunity to pick it up. Good policing is about education. If someone does something wrong and, and the, the police officer can negotiate and discuss with them and calm the situation down, they'll do it rather than put the handcuffs on and take them up to Gailey. It's the same with, with our enforcement on, on litter, surely. The, the discretion is, can you pick that up, please? Yes, great, no, 500 quid. You know, that, that's where the discretion comes in. Um, this actually links into a report that we had a, a little while ago about bad behaviour by dogs, in that we hadn't find anybody because it had been dealt with by education by talking to the owner and so jeremy's points you know raise the same issue about you know if you see somebody drop something can we talk them yeah down? I, I think from from a good practice point of view that would be ideal and it has happened um technically under the eyes of the law it's a little bit like a, a parking fine in a car park if you're paying display tickets expired it is an absolute there and then we have seen you we've witnessed it it is a crime however i have to say we do use that discretion as necessary i think although the law actually says you see it you report it you give a fixed penalty we do have that discretion and we have used it in the past and we have issued warnings i would like to think that there is that discretion i was in um, a shop the other day and there was a big queue and this man took stuff out of his pocket and i don't know couple of hundred pounds fell on the floor. You know, if that had happened somewhere else, he did it himself, bless him. It, it took him a few times to get it all to those silly notes to stay together. But, you know, it's, it's easy for somebody to go in their pocket for something and something else to come out. So, yeah, we do need to have a bit of realism about it. Did everyone vote on that? I think Is it, did we vote on it? Yeah, let's vote again. All those in favour of the re so can recommendation. I, lovely. Can I just so we need some words, do yeah, we? So it, it was basically that we set all the fines at the, the maximum. Right. And... Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's part of the committee. <laughs> so do I need to read these recommendations for us to... Um, and are we taking them on the block? Committee. Yeah. We're taking them on block. And do you need me to read them out to you? No, are you all happy with the recommendations? So can I have a proposal for the recommendations, Ben? Second that? Lewis, all those in favour? Thank you. And can, as an added thing, can we ask about the waistline policy that, that gets brought back to us, please? So that we can... Is that sort of like the bulky waste policy, sorry? Uh, the paid yeah. bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. bulky waste. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, thank you for that. Let's see where we are on this then. So we've done those recommendations. I'm just the community second on the community second. Yeah. If that's okay. Are, are you going to yeah, present that? Uh, yeah, no problem. Yeah. Uh, I the the reason um, we've brought sort of a community safety update as well with this, um, and I apologise that there is no written report to this uh, because I felt it was in it was useful to introduce certainly the committee and the new members. So the fact that the infrastructure safety and growth is um, within our constitution, the sort of scrutiny for community safety. 
Um, and there was a move, a move at Cabinet last year when we did the three-year rolling community safety plan um, that the infrastructure safety and growth move the, any amendments or scrutinise the plan every year until we do a complete refresh of the community safety. Um, the community safety plan is something a community safety partnership is required by law. It's not a constituted group. It's, the, it's a need and a requirement for all partners to work together for community safety. Um, there is a community safety sort of outline plan for 2023-26. I have I sort of circulated um, the um, sort of last year's plan. And also there is a, as an update to a kind of outline working plan that we that we produced at the beginning of the year and where we are. You'll, you'll see in that there are the, the ASB around the sort of updating to the priorities, working and looking at the policies, the environmental crime working group, um, the areas that obviously the police lead on through serious violence and car crime. And... It was really just to have that discussion this evening um, around outlining the sort of priorities um, for the Chief Inspector to give you an update on some of the police plans and if there is anything within the Community Safety Plan then that Scrutiny wants to look at specifically prior to the annual update, um, you'll see in there that we've already got the prevent actions coming within the um, annual update and um, the antisocial behaviour, as I've mentioned, and, and some of the actions that the police look at. Obviously, we work very closely with the police around antisocial behaviour, um, housing through for issues on, on you know with, with, with drugs, uh, vulnerable people. We have a weekly vulnerability meeting. We have a weekly ASB meeting. We do share some of the fines around community protection notices, um, and you know having those conversations with the chair. It's something that we, we, whether it's useful for you to have the, a six monthly update, whether that may be in a, re, a re, report form or a presentation form, but just merely to sort of have that conversation with myself as a community safety lead and the chief inspector from a police point of view, um, as to if there's anything that you would want us to concentrate on, understanding that we do have the annual one in March as well for the whole of the plan. Um, so that was the reason this evening, and I don't know whether, Rob, you want to sort of update on anything particularly on the antisocial behaviour side and we're happy to take some questions or yeah, areas. An antisocial behaviour, so please recall the amount of antisocial behaviour within Tamworth is down 26%. However, that's a bit of a um, deviance from, from where it was. So some of the recording mechanisms that we have within Tamworth has meant that some of that ASB is now turned into harassment or public order offences for crime recording purposes. So it's a bit of a false positive in relation. So where ASB has gone down, crime has gone up because of that change in policy. Um, I think there's a real need, and it's interesting, having the conversations around uh, ASB data that the council uh, have, and how we overlay that with the ASB data that we have. And I think there's still a, quite a bit of work to do in relation to understanding how we can overlay those different forms of, of data to better understand and it's work that's ongoing for that so asb wise that's that's where we are as far as crime and some of those priorities i think i suppose the big headliner is theft of motor vehicles has been uh, really a really serious issue for a number a number of areas and a number of regions uh, over, uh, over the last sort of uh, 18 months and and finally, we, we're, we're starting to get on top of that in relation to uh, theft of motor vehicles, which has seen a reduction uh, of 10%, which is a real fantastic start to where we've been. Um, I think if you look at some of the data, some of the other priorities around serious violence and, and, and knife crime, we've just done Opsepter. And again, knife uh, possession of offensive weapons has seen an incre increase. That's, again, not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, it means we're stopping more people um, with things either in a public place or, a again, a change in leg legislation to make things like knuckle dusters and certain types of knives in a uh, private dwelling is now illegal. So you will see an increase in those sort of offenders, whereas previously it wouldn't be recorded. Um, so lots of work ongoing uh, and quite happy to take any questions. 
Thank you for that. Um, I am aware that changing the way we look at things does change the figures. It always does. Um, and I, I'm also aware by just Facebook things about how many people are concerned about their cars getting stolen off the drive and thing. Does the advent of ring doorbells, there are other kinds, has this made a difference to, to policing? Ring doorbells, yeah, it, it does make a massive difference. So I suppose the figure I'll, I'll quote you is vehicle interference, which has seen a 51% increase. So what door ring bells sort of help us with is that they'll see someone on their driveway where pre historically they wouldn't. And even though they don't take anything, it's still recording as vehicle interference. I think the one thing to remember about um, ring doorbells is sometimes the footage doesn't help us where if they're wearing scarves and balaclavas it's really difficult people will think that we can get a positive outcome from those sort of footages so it's good information it's good intelligence but the likelihood of getting a offense to court through ring doorbell is re relatively limited it, it's just another weapon in people's arsenal though isn't it i suppose and um I recently saw a piece on the news about having your keys in protected things in your house. So once again, it's about communication. Um, yeah, comms for people, letting them know what's going on out there. Anybody got anything? Jeremy? Uh, a couple of things. Um, you just made me think of somebody I know had uh, their car was stolen off the driveway. Uh, their alarm was set off. They pressed the button to turn the alarm off, which gave the guy the code, and off he went. Um, so even though it was in the bag, that was yeah. um, a couple of things uh, in terms of changing statistics, and, and we we understand that, and, and there's a there's a bit of understanding needs to be made around crime reporting and then detection. You know, um, but the big thing that uh, pricks my ears up, we were talking about the the doorbells and recorded images. Uh, I've recently uh, sent a text message to Ben Adams the Police Fire and Crime Commissioner, uh, which I've got to follow it up with a phone call. Um, with what I do for a living now, we have been requested to submit evidence for a number of things from our CCTV systems. Uploading that is an absolute nightmare. You have so many days to upload the evidence, the police send you a link or whatever, uh, and you roll a six to start, uh, and then if you don't get a double, you're, you're, you're out, you know. It is an absolute nightmare to get that evidence uploaded. Uh, I've raised it with the P uh, PFCC, but I think somebody somewhere need, needs to, to pick that up because it is causing me a headache because I'm repeatedly asked for it, but it's also delaying the police uh, in, in, in their process. So getting that evidence uploaded to support is an absolute nightmare at, at the moment. And as a result, uh, I think uh, at least two pieces uh, of evidence that have been requested have never actually made it. Police officers have been into... Uh, our premises and record it on their body cam so they can see the evidence and the current prosecution service can see the screen on their on their, their cam but because it's not the original they can't submit it and it's an absolute nightmare so these guys are visiting me on a regular basis and I'm struggling to to help the process like a piece of work for somebody to um, to look at and take back maybe <laughs> is there anybody else no. Oh, I think. Oh, sorry. No, it, it, something I'll raise. So, so actually, if the instructions for evidence.com aren't really clear, and that that might be the issue, maybe it's some education that we need to send out to to the users. Because I think we just send a link and expect everyone to be able to do exactly the same thing. So, it's something I'll take back uh, to acts on who who run evidence.com in relation to that. Yeah, I, I think, as I say, we, we, we made a conscious decision not to do a sort of big full report at this point in time, because uh, we, we will be doing. Obviously, the, the sort of outline work plan there, we've, we've circulated with this. So I think if you, you know, would like to consider that work plan, I think it was really to, to, you understand, to understand that we are working in partnership. We share those priorities. We share 
the powers to to do to do sort of take actions um we meet we we we, we are having a triage process that sort of on our isb processes working with the police and it includes some training through the police and crime commissioner um you know that the environmental crime group is working as i said with the environmental crime project um that we, you know we, we keep the figures and every year we will we'll do the full report at the end of, of march around you know engage in diversionary activities what we're funding how we funded it um but but each on that work plan uh there are areas of things that we are concentrating on for the for, for this thing so it was really that conversation around how you'd want to see it moving forward and we're quite happy aren't we rob to do two a year if that's what's something that the committee would like and we can provide data sort of six months in as well as on on the 12 months if that's something that would be useful uh, but certainly that work plan is there for you to have a, a look at and will be circulated with the minutes. That's a recommend that that's yeah. absolutely fine. We have no problem with that. And if that's you know with the portfolio holder we can we can work work on that. Yeah. If you need to leave now, we're going to run for it. <laughs> As I on a Tuesday, it's my singing night. <laughs> Going on to item eight, our working group updates. Our migrant travelling community, we had a date in the diary and we had to not go along with that one. We are looking at having our first meeting on Monday, if that is confirmed. So we will There's confirm that. Some training on Monday. So oh, is there? Some finance, any risk management training, I think. If right. I remember. I think I'd put it in at five. Can you remember if I'd said five o'clock? It's only on teens, so yeah. six, yeah. Oh, yeah, I think I had. I think I'd said, okay. said earlier to... Yeah. Yeah. Had I said six? We'll, we'll sort round our time. It's, it's just me, Lewis and Rosie, so we'll, okay. we'll see what we can do. Um, the HGV driver um, issue, were we going to look at a new team for that? Uh, yeah, if we if we can. Um, yeah. Obviously, Tina's not on the committee anymore. No. Um, Sarah's still interested. Um, I've got nothing to update in the minute, but we are looking at three sort of work streams. So yeah, uh, if anybody else is interested in joining that uh, subcommittee, that would be great. Yeah, I'll be happy to come along to that. Yeah. Yeah, can and Rob, I think Rob nodded there. Oh. <laughs> Shocking. Thank you for that. Shocking, Rob. Um, and I've already touched on the working group for the housing repairs that we've had our initial meeting, so we will report back to um, to the committee after the next meeting. Uh, so are there any items on the forward plan that the committee would like to review? So, uh, Leanne tells me there hasn't been much of a change to the forward plan, so we're... Um, we'll go on to item 10 then, the work plan discussion. So... We have a new layout for the work plan to make it make it easier for us. Oh, too, too many, they all look the same, <laughs> don't they? So um, we have our, our three items tonight, but in Monday we have our quarterly report. So we've got the future high street funds and the dual stream, but we may well put the plastic pollution bit that we um, talked about at a previous meeting onto that because it fits in with the dual stream bit so that's on the 17th of january um, we've also been asked to review the new heritage engagement on a six month after it's been going for six months so that will come to this committee for um for a look at um so yeah we, next meeting is the 17th of january which is seems a long way away but i'm sure it will come quickly is there anything anybody else wants to see on the work plan or are you happy with it as it is? This is perhaps a chance for you, Lewis, to have a look see and see if there's anything that you especially want to... Because we want to be inclusive. If there's something that is really, you know, 
something you want to look at, we will look at getting that on, on the thing. So we'll go on to item 11N, exclusion of the press and public. Due to the nature of the final items, we are going to move to a restricted session and ask the committee to consider excluding the press and public from the meeting by passing the following resolution. That in accordance with the provisions of the local authorities, executive arrangements, meeting and access to information, England regulations 2012 and section 104, 100A.4 of the Local Government Act 1972, the press and public be excluded from the meeting during the consideration of the following business on the grounds that it involves the likely disclosure of inve exempt information as defined in paragraphs 3 of part 1 of schedule 12A to the Act and the public interest in withholding the information outweighs the public interest in disclosing the information to the public. Okay. Moved okay. by Ben, seconded by Ben. All those in favour? Thank you very much. We will now 